So it's the gospel being proclaimed through the scriptures. So this is why we keep on encouraging you people to read the scriptures. The scripture, the whole of scripture is the gospel. And the gospel is always according to the scriptures. And as we shall see today, um, as the gospel is proclaimed with endurance over a very long time, not changing one bit of the same gospel, even though there is, of course, a great temptation to change the gospel in order to make people want to listen to the gospel. But we keep on preaching the same gospel over a long time. It's the power of God to transform our lives, to build our lives, to build the church of God. And it is my prayer that we will endure in our church Till we see the power of God building us up personally, individually, and building the church out, increasing it numerically. So this is a map of Paul's second missionary journey, because we're just talking, we're talking about the second missionary journey of Paul. And uh, you can see from the map, he, he went up and across Cappadocia and Cilicia, Galatia and Asia. Remember, the Lord, the Spirit didn't want them to, to preach the gospel there. And then they had a vision from Philippi, and they went across to Philippi on the other side, and that's Macedonia, and that's Europe, right? And they started a church in Philippi, and then they were persecuted in there, and they went across to Thessalonica. And we're talking about Thessalonica uh, and the, the next city, Berea. So they were again persecuted in Thessalonica, they went to Berea. And then the Bereans took them uh, uh, all the way down and came and brought Paul uh, down. I don't see Berea in there. Maybe it's such a wrong map. Uh, but then he brought Paul down to, to Athens. So this is, this is what we're, we're talking about, Thessalonica. We're talking about Berea. So four, um, four points. Uh, point number one, preaching the gospel from Scripture with endurance is powerful in persuading people to join our fellowship. Let's read this together. After they passed through Amphipolis in Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As usual, Paul went into the synagogue and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas including a large number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of the leading women. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So preaching the gospel from Scripture, that's what he did. But he did it through three Sabbaths, three weeks. Imagine that. First week, no converts. No one turned to Jesus. Second week, again, preaching the same gospel. No one turns to Jesus. You imagine the discouragement in the hearts, right? thinking, well, maybe we can change, maybe we can slightly modify the gospel. Maybe people is not really taking in the fact that the Messiah was a suffering Messiah. See, this is great temptation for us to, you see people, I mean, you think about our church, there used to be people here who did not really believe what we believe, and they've left. Great temptation is to, to, to change the practices, you know, the, the, the message that we preach, it was the same, right? But then Paul endured with the same gospel. And this is the message for us. See? In the church of God, we endure with the same message all the time. You know, you listen around in the Facebook and uh, you may hear something new, but, you know, every time you hear something new, I ask you to cast doubt on it. You should check it up. Because the gospel is just the old gospel, right? Jesus suffered, he died, rose again from the dead, and that's the Jesus we are proclaiming to people as the Messiah. Now you come every Sunday here, you would get to hear, that's just the same message, we endure. Because this message is a powerful message, right? On three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. Now, when Paul encouraged young Timothy to continue on preaching, he, tells, he, he told him, Timothy, preach the word. Be ready in season, out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and teaching. Why? 
For the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine. Isn't it what we're facing today? People do not want to hear the teachings of the scripture. And it's always the great temptation for us preachers to slightly change the gospel. So that people would like to hear it. Right? Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe we can, we can say, look, you know, Jesus didn't really die. Something like that. Or Jesus died, but you know, you don't really need to repent. I think that's the message today that is being becoming prominent in most of the Methodist churches today. Ministers don't preach uh, uh, pro repent repentance anymore. Right? Jesus died, but you can do whatever you want. You see, they changed the gospel. But here we're told we must continue to preach the word with great patience and teaching even when people turn away from it. You know those people who taught me to preach when I was uh, at uni, I still remember them and I, some of them had gone to be with the Lord, but I still from time to time go and listen to them because I admire their faithfulness. It's the same message that Philip Jensen preached to us back then in the 90s, still preaching today. Same message, same Jesus. Great patience and endurance, even though people are turning away from the gospel today. Even though people will leave our church because they're dissatisfied. I hope it's not they're dissatisfied with me, but I can see it's because of their dissatisfaction with what we believe that they turn away from us. Again, you see, he was explaining for three weeks, proving it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer. Why was it necessary for the Messiah to suffer? Peter says, he died to sins so that we all died with him to sins. And because he had died to sin, we should no longer live in sin. We should live in righteousness. You see, this is the gospel. He died for, our, for my sins. So that I live righteously. He died to change my life. He died so that I no longer live for myself. I live for him who had died for me. See, that's, that's why he had to suffer. That's why Paul had to endure three weeks explaining to them it was necessary for Jesus to die. Otherwise, you know, if he didn't die, imagine if he came down from the cross, then Satan would be victorious. And we will be condemned to hell forever and ever. All of us. You see, he died because our condemnation was put on him. Condemnation for sin. So that we can live now righteously. As sin is still there in our lives. But it doesn't have any control in us. We hate sin. Well, he hates us as well. But we hate sin, see. That's why we confess our sins and we keep on asking God to put to death our sins. Because he died so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. By his wounds, we have been healed. For you and me were like sheep going astray, but you have now returned. See, that's, that's the other reason why he died. Not only he died to make us righteous, but he died so that we may be able to return to the shepherd. You know what Jesus says in John 10? The reason why people don't believe in him because they do not belong to him. They, they do not belong to his sheep. But we, people whom the gospel have moved in our hearts, have now returned because we want to live for the great shepherd. We love him for what he had done for us. He is the overseer of our souls. You see, I'm called a pastor because I'm meant to look after your souls, but I'm always comforted knowing I don't know your souls. I don't know where your souls are, but I know that the great overseer of our souls, he knows your souls, he knows my souls, and he knows what you need, he knows what I need in order to be encouraged. So he died. It was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise again so that we be made righteous, we be drawn to God himself because we cannot do that on our own. And then eventually, after three weeks, some of them were persuaded. See, this is why we're not ashamed of the gospel. This is why we won't give up preaching the gospel. You see, those who taught me to preach, they said to me, you go and preach the word until the cows come home. 
until the cows come home, even if no one comes, you would never change the gospel. You keep preaching the gospel because the gospel is the power of God. It's not me. It's not the pastors. It is the, the gospel of God that will change us, that will make us, that will put faith in your heart and in my heart. The second point is this. Preaching the gospel from scripture brings the kingdom of God to confrontation with the kingdom of this world together. But the Jews became jealous and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and started a riot in the city, attacking Jason's house. They searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too, and Jason has welcomed them. They are all acting contrary to Caesar's degree, saying, There is another king, Jesus. The crowd of the city officials who heard these things were upset. After taking a security bond from Jason and the others, they released them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be. So, preaching the gospel from Scripture brings the kingdom of God into confrontation. See, every time we face persecution, it's the embodiment of the kingdoms of this world, of the devil who is behind this opposition to the word of God. It's them that comes against us, the kingdom of the They hate us. They hate our message because our message is always overturning the values of this world, right? And so they attacked Jason's house. They were searching for them to bring them out to the public assembly. They couldn't find them. But you see, it's a reminder for us. You know, when we're persecuted, it's hard to endure persecution. It's hard to endure people slandering us and saying all kinds of bad things about us. But you know, we must remember what Jesus said. You are not of the world. We don't belong to this world. Because if we had belonged to this world, the world would love us. But we, because we don't belong to this world, because Jesus has chosen us out of this world, this world will hate us, will always persecute us, will always confront us, and want to stop us, to prevent us from living and preaching the gospel. And they would say what they said here, these men who have turned the world upside down, you know, this is how the world looks at us. Look at, looks at our gospel. Our gospel is overturning the world. It's true. Because you see what the gospel says. Whoever wants to become great, this world tells you, be ambitious. You know, strive after your ambitions. Strive after your goal. Go up the ladder. Right? Walk all over all kinds of people in order to make you the, the best person in the job. But Jesus tells us, if you want to become great, be a servant. Do you see the overturning of the values of this world? And this world, of course, you know, you listen to them, they tell you, you know, all kinds of things about gender confusion and homosexuality and transgenderism. But the Bible is always straightforward. Okay? God made them in the beginning male and female. See, this, the values of this world is confusing, right? You may have heard of the Olympics. You know, that man who punched the woman in the mouth. We used to say there's domestic violence. It's called Olympics these days, right? See, God made male and female. Our valley is always overturning this world because it's clear. It's not confusing at all. And then you see, who, whoever wants to save his life will lose it. Whoever wants to lose his life because of me will save it. This world will tell you, you know, seek to, be, to live in this world comfortably. Get your house, get your boat, get your whatever it is, save your money. Live comfortably in this world. But Jesus tells us, lose it and live for me and you will save yourself and even the things you gather to yourself, right? This world tells you, amass all kinds of things to yourself because if you die with uh, the most toys or whatever it is, treasures, you know, you, they say you'll die happy. But see what the Bible says, you, you prepare all kinds of things. You amass to yourself wealth and money and, and, and honor and all kinds of things. All the things you prepared, you die. So whose they will be? So you've got to keep asking yourself that whatever it is you're gathering to yourself in this world, you won't get it, right? And then they say they're all acting contrary to Caesar's degree, saying there is another king, Jesus. Yes, 
Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it's not of this world, we should not set our minds on the things of this world. We should set our minds on the things of the other world, the things above. And therefore, we put to death. We put to death the sins in our lives. We no longer conform to the values of this world. We are transformed because we belong to the kingdom of King Jesus. Number three, the scriptures confirm the gospel of the suffering and rising Messiah and lead many to believe together. As soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Upon arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including a number of prominent Greek women. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks to you. So, so here's the Berean. They received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily. You know, it's very important not to read, not only to read the scripture, but also to make sure that when you listen to preachers, if you listen to people on Facebook or YouTube, grab your Bible and make sure you examine it, you check it. Because, you know, otherwise it's a waste of your time, you know, listening to those things if you're not preaching from the Bible. See, that's, see, only through the scriptures that we can grow as a church of God. Because you see, we need the scriptures from, from after this service. See? Because you know, if you've just come and, and, and this is your, uh, your, your weekly um, your new spiritual food or spiritual nutrition, and, and then you go away from, from, from Monday to Saturday without eating anything, you see, only by the grace of God, I think you'll be able to, to, to come back on Sunday. This is why we encourage you to read the Word of God daily. You know, it's a great battle. I think those of you who try to read your Word, it's a great battle. Even us, even I myself, I find there are a number of things during the day that makes me busy. It distracts my attention. But I always try to come back to the Scripture. You know, it requires a lot of discipline. And especially today, you know, with, uh, with uh, Facebook and YouTube and, and, and you know, influencing our attention. Because we, I'm told now that uh, the average attention of a person who's using smartphone is about eight seconds. There's just no hope for preaching this long, isn't it? No one would listen to this. Anyway, so they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily. And here's Jesus. Jesus said to, to the, so he's, he's speaking to Jews, unbelievers, and said, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is this. It is the scriptures that testify about me. And you are unwilling to come to me so that you may have life. We, we read the scriptures because only the scriptures can point us to Christ. It can also make us wise to believe. You know, this is what Paul says to Timothy, right? Continue on in the scripture because it's scripture that makes you wise, wise to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And lastly, opposition to the gospel follows us and only makes us see how much we need our brothers and sisters in Christ together. But when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there too agitating and upsetting crowds. Then the brothers and sisters immediately sent Paul away to go to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed on there. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be you. So wherever we go with the gospel, there will always be opposition. Wherever you go as a Christian, you should always expect that if people know that you're Christian, you will be persecuted. There will, there will always be opposition because Jesus said, you know, we will be hated because we do not belong to this world. We belong to Jesus. He has called us out from this world. So these people thought that they were taking Paul to safety, right? They had to take him from Berea all the way to Athens. It's a journey that had to, be, they had to go through via the coast. I think they took a boat. But when they got to Athens and uh, they, th those people were escorting, they thought he was safe. But you see what Paul says? He felt, he still felt unsafe. So he asked them to tell Silas and Timothy who stayed back, you know, in order to build the faith of those there, 
to come as quickly as possible. You know, the more oppositions we face, the more we realize that we need our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to stand together. And as Paul says, you know, in his letter to, uh, to the Philippians, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, in no way alarmed by your opponents, which is a sign of destruction to them. See, as we stand together amongst oppositions, it's scary for our opponents, for those who are persecuting us. So let's pray that we all love one another. As the, the more we face oppositions and persecutions and people slandering us, the more we should love each other and pray for one another. You know, it's good that we pray for you know, a lot of who fear of all those things at the end. But maybe you should, uh, you should have a list of people you need to pray for amongst the congregation. And I want to ask you, you know, if you are critical of myself and the, the pastors or the Setuata and people around us, ask the Lord to take that critical spirit away because eventually if you're critical, it'll become slandering, it'll become gossip, it'll become pita in your heart and everything will turn evil. You know, I always say this, but this is what happens. You know, it's, it's people sitting there and they're critical of all kinds of things of myself. You know, try and ask God to suppress those critical minds. We need each other. We must stand together. We must learn to forgive each other. We must learn to bear with each other, to be patient with each other. Because we're facing opposition everywhere you go as a Christian. So let's, let's pray.